Good morning. I will appear, appeal to nostalgia to begin this. And I want to talk a little bit about childhood and maybe a childhood that many of you can relate to. As I grew up, I grew up with stories from my father of playing baseball barefoot in the cow field. He grew up in the rural community in the Appalachia of Newport, which is in Giles County, not too far from here. And so many a summer day was spent barefoot with a broken baseball bat, as you can see there, and a few friends playing a game that everyone loved. And through the years, this became part of a community narrative. Kids got together to play. There wasn't any organization to it. There was no official league. There was no rules. It was basically a hard scrabble game played in a cow field. And that really interested me as I got older. It seemed as though that we were working more and more to do less and less, going to all these links to organize formal sports there, when in many ways a cow field and a few bats suffice to build community. There was quality there as well. In this picture that you're seeing here, you will actually uh, see people who go on to coach at Division I baseball schools, uh, at Division I baseball. There are individuals there who went on to play semi-pro. There's individuals there who actually went on to play overseas, all from the cow field. In my community of Newport, baseball and softball was somewhat of a tradition. This picture here is from 1911. It's a youth team there. So we know as far back as 1911, kids were gathering together playing this game. Town teams, as there were in many communities, were fairly prominent. Uh, our town team in Newport actually played against Virginia Tech for Virginia Tech's first baseball game ever in 1892. Score was 18 to 8, that we know. Virginia Tech says they won, we say we won. The debate continues to this day. <laughs> Tech apparently back then had a better offense than they do these days, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> But through the years, these town teams seemed to almost be our Calvary. They formed almost this line in the sand, almost literally where the ball field is. We're a tough town. We're a small town, but we're tough. You don't cross us. And when I look at these pictures from my dad's childhood of these teams that he played on, that was the image I had. This actually translated into greater success for a number of folks from our community became uh, we had a pitcher, Bob Porterfield, who pitched for the Senators in the 1950s. He was actually the top winner in the American League in 53, which, if you know anything about baseball history, to do that on the Washington Senators was no small miracle. In the 90s, we actually had an, a two-time All-Star with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And again, to be an All-Star with the Pittsburgh Pirates, also no small miracle. What was more impressive, though, was the bonds that formed from baseball. As I looked through these images, they were really telling of friends getting together on a sunny afternoon, sitting on the fender of a car, drinking a Dr. Pepper. Those images, to me, were building community. They were the foundation of what our community was about. Through the years, as I got older, I played on teams in the community. These were some of my teammates. And this is actually me with my little brother there. You may not be able to tell, but there's actually dirt on my face. I slid into home. Uh, right before this picture was taken there. You remember when you slide into home. You remember the dirt on your face. It's part of your personal legend, and those personal legends become a collective narrative for community. And collective narratives are what ties together. Without those, we're nothing more than a name on a map. And so baseball was this collective narrative for us. The metaphors of baseball and community was not lost on me. If you think about baseball, you make this circular path constantly taking you back home, revisiting these same steps back home, back home. When you step across that foul line, literally, you're on a level playing field. It doesn't matter the background of the person next to you, you're part of a team. Corporations and even universities have been trying to duplicate this for years. I find small towns are much better at it to this day. But for my own community, the teams folded in the late 90s and early 2000s. I can't give you one singular reason why this happened. There was maybe a lack of kids one year, someone who couldn't coach, 
different things happened. It wasn't that kids didn't play ball. It's just that they played on other teams. But there was no longer jerseys with Newport on them. Psychologically, I felt this had an effect for our community. What happens when there's no longer a team? What happens when there's no one to cheer for? What happens when there's no longer a common struggle? I don't think it was coincidence that in the, the 10 to 15 years that we were without a team in the community, our women's club folded. We had a community women's club for 50 years and it folded. Our Rutan club went from 40 members to less than 10. In many ways, I think there was a psychological impact to no longer see kids on the playground and to see it grow over with waist-high weeds. I don't have a picture of that because communities don't take pictures of their low times. We take pictures of good times. And so for me, this summer was about coming back to good times. There was a few parents and I have been talking for a number of years about trying to get teams back. We still had a field, growed over though it was, we still had a field. Could we get back playing on it? And so doing what you would normally do to organize something, this past May, we put flyers around the community, we have free pizza, and we tell kids to show up. With a caveat, no cost. I still don't understand why you have to have a $200 bat to hit with when a half-broken bat in a cow field works just fine. So I didn't want to see this cost people just come out and play. And what was important is that it did work. That old cliche from a, a good baseball movie, if you build it, they will come, actually does work. If you build it, they will come. And so that's what happens. As I was doing one of the flyers one night, I happened to look down at this picture, which just coincidentally was right on the desk where I was working. And I was actually working at my, my parents' house on this. And this picture was of one of my dad's teammates uh, as part of local legend. He actually uh, one time called time in the batter's box, and he told the ump, the baseball has a broken thread. And they called time, and he was right. Legend. But what was interesting is that one of the kids that I knew was going to sign up was his great-granddaughter. And so for me, something jumped in my mind there. This was not recreation. This was recreation. We were recreating pride, recreating community, recreating the things that were part of our common narrative. We were recreating bonds between generations. And so this took on a different meaning for me as I went through the season. Getting people back on the field, getting playing was really important. We raised the flag there. And it was much more to me than a symbolic gesture. It was something there that we did together that was teaching, recreating. It was recreating what it meant to be in small town America for me, part of it. As you can see there, our field had work to do, but the more shoes you get on a field, the easier it is to maintain. And so our goal was to get shoes on the field. We had generations together. This was my dad who grew up playing on the field. My dad actually played overseas, and this is my daughter there together. I will admit it wasn't coincidence I both got him number three. You can do that when you organize the league. <laughs> My old coach there, who's on the right there, his daughter came out and coached with me. And it was neat to see him come back out and coach with, and then for her to come back out. And our first game, I remember looking over, and she had put eye black on her face. You don't usually see coaches do that, but I was like, yeah, that's what we need to be about. We need to recapture our toughness. And as I looked at some of these pictures that we took through the year, I began to see similarities to some of the old pictures that I just shared with you, those bonds of friendship. We were beginning to see kind of this coalescing of community coming together there. With our kids, we actually did a loudspeaker. We had a portable a loudspeaker that we got from one of the local churches. And we actually announced when batters came up. And this is me uh, getting on a, off on a tangent here, but that's what today is about, tangents. But I struggle with cheering for millionaires who don't ethically do the right things. Why then can we not cheer over loudspeakers for three- and four-year-olds? Why can we not announce their name? Why can't their ears hear their name being called? Why can't people cheer for them, even if it's on a dusty, small-town field? And so that's what we did. No cost. You hear your name called, and you got stickers when you crossed home plate. 
Millionaires don't get stickers when they cross home plate. <laughs> we began seeing that toughness again. That's actually my daughter there. She is as advertised. I'm proud of her. <laughs> it's what you do when you're a parent to a four-year-old girl. You make them tough. Softball machines. But we began nurturing the game. We began teaching. And we provide the space for parents to come out in the field and teach a game that they knew. And community began to gather again. Those of you who had the misfortune of being on these things called steering committees can attest to they rarely steer anything. <laughs> this is much better. Have a game. Get the parents together and talk about what the community needs. That group right there raised $2,500 to get us started. We had no money this year. But that group gathered under that tree there, did spaghetti suppers, fundraisers, took donation letters around, asked around, and we got money to get us going with uniforms. And I began to see similarities between these pictures of today and yesterday. There was this imaginary line being formed there again. We're tough. We're back. We're a community again. I saw hope in the kids there. It's fun to coach three-year-old redheads. I will say that. <laughs> it's going to be more fun when she learns to pitch. She'll be intimidating just to look at. I know that. We were inclusive. Boundaries. Why can't you show up, no matter what your background is or your, your ability is there, be a part of this, share in the game. This particular child here actually uh, has only one hand that she's able to use. The last time I checked, you only need one hand to pitch. And so she became a pitcher for our team. The softball program really was one of my pride and joys for this year, and I'll end today with a story on this team, and this is called The Legend of the Bluebirds. I believe communities need legends. Do cul-de-sacs have legends? No. Do subdivisions have legends? No. Communities have legends. And so when we formed a team this year, we had these pretty blue uniforms. And I admit to being a little bit of a softy. I enjoy watching birds. We have bluebirds around the park there. And so I called us the bluebirds. What I didn't realize is that other softball teams out there have names like Crushers, the Blaze, <laughs> the Intimidators. And so I called us the bluebirds really not knowing that. When we show up for our first game, we we're going against the, the Buena Vista Blaze, I believe it was. And they asked what our team name was. I said, we're, we're the Bluebirds. And it sounds like a mismatch from the beginning, you know. And, and it was. Uh, we didn't win a game this year. We tied one. You can always rationalize that's a victory. We tied one. But this team here of girls really came together. In spite of that, we worked on the game. Some of our girls didn't really know three strikes and you're out. It was a little embarrassing as a coach to have to yell out there and say, you can sit down now. You can sit down. That was, that was three, four, five. You know, so, um, so again, it, it became part of a legend to build this team. And I remember the first time I heard someone from the, span, the stands yell, go Newport, go Bluebirds. It was fun to hear. But I'll share with you the legend of Hannah. Our first game for our 11 and 12-year-olds was against one of our county teams. There was only other, one other softball team in the county. And so naturally we want to beat them because it's the county and that's what we do. We, we take on our other teams there. And so Hannah's 11 years old and playing her first game, left field. And all this time, heartache of getting uniforms together, practicing, working on fundamentals. This is a softball, three strikes, use two hands. All that comes out to the first batter of her first game, and she's in left field. And the first batter hits a fly ball right to her. And time stood still for a moment. That ball's in the air, and I'm telling you, three seconds can feel like three minutes when a ball's hit right to an 11-year-old girl. And I can attest that you can break a sweat in three seconds because I saw her dad, who I played ball with, break a sweat right there next to me. I thought he was going to fall over. <laughs> and so Hannah there, innocent Hannah standing there, and it's hit right to her. Now the rule of thumb when you hit a fly ball to 11-year-olds is typically if you hit it right at them, they won't catch it. They'll make the hard ones, they'll miss the easy ones. And Hannah's standing there, and she's watching. 
And I swear I could almost see her eyes bat. And she stuck out her glove, and it fell right in it. <laughs> and I played it straight. One out, guys, one out, one out. Meanwhile, the crowd erupted. I mean, the Boston Red Sox celebration had nothing on us. You thought we won the World Series. We had one out. <laughs> one out, one down. Hannah had it all the way. All the way. The fact that she didn't use two hands beside the point. <laughs> she caught it. One out. That's how an 11-year-old girl can become a legend. That's how a community can build a narrative again, a story. That's how we find our way back to a sense of home. Thank you.